Hi, welcome back. I'm Grayson Ottaway, and this is Marvelous Videos. What actually started off as a sketch of a turtle with a mask by the dynamic duo Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird eventually expanded into six feature films, half a dozen television series, seven comic series, including a daily comic strip, a multitude of video games, and let's not miss out on the two concert tours. There is no denying that the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles franchise has a huge fan base and continues to remain popular till this very day. This brings our attention to the mutant DNA inside them that lets them do things that you can't even gauge in the first place. Now we all know that it is the infamous ooze that created these mutant turtles and while it is only logical to believe that the turtles are incapable of reproduction, things are definitely not what it looks like. We know what you're thinking, it is true that we haven't seen any children of the turtles yet, but that is precisely why we are doing this video. Watch this video till the very end to know everything about the TMNT reproduction. Let's dive in, shall we? Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. A small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles can reproduce. For those of you who remember the Mirage Studios comics run of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you are bound to remember the character of Seti, or in other words, the Styracodon Princess who set Michelangelo's heart on fire. The later part of the comics run shows Michelangelo as the assigned facilitator of Seti on the latter's visit to Earth, with Seti asking Michelangelo to take her to the Museum of Natural History in order to see the relics of the planet's past. The latter suggests the former not to bring along her uptight, overprotective bodyguards. Well, of course the bodyguards are in no mood to put the bipedal turtle in charge of their princess and exhibit their dismissive demeanor towards them, a characteristic that Michelangelo had previously been warned about. With Michelangelo telling them that he has fought their kind before and also defeated them, the bodyguards counter-question him, asking if he has actually fought against a Styracodon, to which Michelangelo corrects them and says that he has fought and defeated Triceratons. The bodyguards continue mocking him and refer to the Triceratons as their three-horned, distant, inferior cousins. Seti, having had enough of the verbal exchange between her bodyguards and Michelangelo, asserts that she will have her bodyguards accompany her, because she, for obvious reasons, trusts them over Michelangelo. Before heading out of the base facility, Michelangelo informs them about the protocol of making every first-time visitor to Earth watch an orientation disc, one that will give them an overview of the basic North American customs. Later, inside the Hall of Dinosaurs at the New York City Museum of Natural History, Michelangelo is clearly able to make out that something is not right with Seti and asks her if she is fine. Seti tells him that seeing the remains of the noble dinosaurs being displayed played like that seemed both undignified and a bit ghoulish to her, but then again it was her decision to come there in the first place. Michelangelo tells her it is a human thing to have their own dead on display and cites the mummies that they had seen earlier inside the Egyptian hall. In the hopes of cheering her up, Michelangelo asks Seti where she would like to visit next, to which the latter tells him about her favorite vacation place and delicacy back in her home world. With her asking if Earth has something similar, Michelangelo Angelo knows exactly where to take her. He tells Seti and her bodyguards to follow him, so as to grab a few things before they leave. But what we see next is just the duo of Michelangelo and Seti on a motor guzzi taking Route 101 in New Hampshire. With Michelangelo telling her that they have arrived at their destination, Seti lets out a sigh of relief. Michelangelo tells her all about the fast food stuff that they're going to indulge in, along with the sea bugs that she had mentioned to him earlier. Seti is also seen to be way more compatible with Michelangelo now. She not only tells him that she wouldn't behave like a spoiled, privileged, demanding princess, also tells him to place the order on her behalf. An excited Michelangelo ends up ordering what he calls a sampler lunch to help Seti try out a different list of things and also asks her to address him as Mike going forward. It is then that we learn that it was Seti's idea to ditch her bodyguards in the first place. 
Michelangelo is next seen giving Seti a tour of the coast of Maine, one that she addresses as the Benathic seawall of her homeworld. She has also become a fan of the fried clams that Michelangelo treated her to, and calls it food fit for royalty. So much so that she even has plans of returning back to her homeworld, shipping some of them along with her. As for Michelangelo, he suggests her two options. First, that she would take fresh live clams instead of the fried ones back to her home world. And second, that he will try to lay his hands on the recipe of the fried clams for her. Seeing an empty bench in front, Seti decides to sit down for a while and rest her sore legs. By now, it should not come as a surprise to you that both of them are actually seen to enjoy each other's company and have also opened up to one another, each giving the other a sneak peek into their personal lives. Then there comes a point when Seti decides to go swimming. Fair to say Michelangelo is already falling for her and is pretty fascinated by her swimming skills too. When they surface up, Seti gets interested when she spots a few lobster fishing boats and upon getting to know about the trap lobsters, or in her words, the delectable saltwater arthropods, she dives back down to check. With Seti attempting to nab a lobster from the trap, Michelangelo is left with no other choice but to stop her from doing so and hold her by her hand in the process. Seti is absolutely furious by his actions and ends up hitting him, further going to the extent of calling him names and telling him that she'd also like to have a new guide. Not just any, but one that knows his place and one with the proper degree of respect. Michelangelo's explanation falls on deaf ears and she goes back underwater only to get badly entangled in one of the fishing nets. Michelangelo is successful in cutting off the net with a knife that he had found on the lobster fishing boat and bringing her ashore to safety. He revives her through CPR and mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilation. With Seti regaining back her consciousness and learning what Michelangelo did to save her, she got aroused by the idea that they shared breath. Smitten by his gestures, she asks Michelangelo to go back swimming in the sea and eventually discloses her real intentions of mating with him. Their relationship reaches a whole new level when Michelangelo wakes up the next morning to discover that Seti has laid a bunch of eggs, ones that she is seen addressing as their children to Michelangelo. Seti is also seen to be quite overprotective about the eggs and does not let even Michelangelo lay his hands on them. With the duo thinking that they need a container for the eggs, Michelangelo heads up to Ogunquit Beach to buy a bag. He comes back to see the bodyguards of Seti having found their location and taking away the eggs. Michelangelo intervenes right on time, and while he is initially able to throw a few kicks and punches at them, he is soon incapacitated by the bodyguards and rendered unconscious. It is not even all. He is also smuggled along with the eggs to Seti's homeworld by the bodyguards. Now every TMNT fan out there is already aware of the unfinished status of Volume 4 four of the comic series. So imagine what will happen if the eggs end up hatching and the offspring are seen to survive. It goes without saying that the whole thing will categorically be the primary example of the turtles being capable of reproduction. It's her, guys, of it's her. Of course it's her, Donnie. Hey, really glad you could make it. Can humans and TMNT reproduce? Proceed at your own risk and don't blame us if your childhood memory of the TMNT gets tainted. First things first, they are turtles, which points out towards a very simple fact. They are supposed to be attracted towards other turtles. Now comes the fact that they aren't just regular turtles. They are anthropomorphic mutant ones, which automatically makes them incompatible when it comes to procreating with other regular turtles. This is where Jonathan Liebesman's 2014 superhero flick Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comes into play. Remember the scene that had Megan Fox's April O'Neil coming face to face with the turtles for the first time. They could easily have had it their way, but instead they chose to give her her phone back and honestly, if you ask us, they became more like a sucker for the opposite gender. Next comes the part that the turtles aren't even related to each other. Each of them comes from a different lineage and the only reason Splinter addresses them as son is because of him adopting them in the first place. It is only fair to address them as a quartet of excited male turtles who definitely like to take the mating 
route given a chance, and the fact that the four of them have been raised together in captivity, making it all the more possible on their part to turn to each other eventually. After all, like it or not, it is actually pretty common for a turtle to display homosexual behavior. Having said all of that, there is also a high probability that these mutated turtles are infertile due to them being exposed to mutagen, and you know this cannot be treated lightly. Exposure to radiation can make them sterile for obvious reasons, and let's say even if they aren't sterile, you can't possibly have two separate species mate with each other in the hopes of looking for an offspring. You know, it's just not possible. Unbelievable. Let me look at you. I'm a hard guy to impress, but how to make a real-life teenage mutant ninja turtle. If you are versed with how the mutation works, half of your job is already done. We are specifically talking about the ooze, or in other words, the gooey liquid that metamorphoses living organisms that it comes into contact with. For those of you who are on the lookout for the origin of the ooze, aim either towards highly advanced laboratories, or even better, an alien source. While the latter isn't really feasible, a recent study has reported a process which resorts to using natural biological functions to change DNA and at will. The process, which is addressed as CRISPR, lets us remove as well as add bits of genetic code in unthinkable ways, further implicating that an organism's DNA can be altered in positive ways. But having said that, the process is still at its initial stage. There's a long way to go. Next comes making a ninja turtle, and for that we have to be responsible for the actions. Some earlier researchers pointed out that it is just not possible to alter the mind without altering the body. Both are directly related to each other. In this case, the attempt to make a turtle more intelligent requires a certain amount of change in their bodies as well. It is only fair to assume that creating a population of humanoid animals will be in certain need of changes that are beyond our levels of comprehension right at this moment. But who knows what the future might hold for us. With this, we have come to the very end of our video here. Do hit us with your thoughts in the comments section and stay tuned with us for more interesting content. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thank you. Dude.